good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on the time of the hour when you're watching this episode and depending on where you're watching us from. I welcome you. My name is Ben Fetcher and this is Beholding Christ Show. And I am so blessed this wonderful day. I thank the Lord for he is good. I thank him for he has been faithful. The Bible says that his faithfulness is eternal. His faithfulness is from everlasting to everlasting. And I know you've been well. I know that you are enjoying the goodness of the Lord. You are enjoying the favor of God. No matter what is happening around us, no matter what is happening in the nation, we are all blessed and we are enjoying Christ and his goodness today. So I welcome you to our uh, show today. I know you will enjoy what you are going to learn today. Today I want to speak about eternal life, eternal life, eternal life. And uh, I know we'll have a wonderful moment. And I want us to pray first so that we can get into the word. Father, we rejoice because you have loved us so much. Not that we loved you, but that you loved us first. And what we can enjoy and what we can rest on and what we can, uh, we can rest assured of is that, Father, you love us so much and your love is from everlasting to everlasting. Therefore, Lord, we are eternally loved. We thank you that you, you, you are watching over us. You take care of us even at a time like this, oh God. We thank you that we are blessed in Christ Jesus. I thank you for my listeners and my viewers today. I call them blessed. And my Lord, how I pray that even as I share this word, let revelation knowledge flow freely unhindered in the name of Jesus Christ, that our eyes will be enlightened, that we may walk in the understanding with that which is of Christ. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen and amen. So I've said that we are going to talk about eternal life today, and I want us to begin with a very common verse, a very common part of the, of the Bible that I believe everyone that is in the world knows this verse. It is in the, in the book of John chapter 3, John chapter 3. Uh, and I'm reading from the New King James Version, John chapter 3, verse number 16. John 3, 16. But let me start from verse number uh, uh, 14. The Bible says, And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. Mm -hmm. So he's talking about uh, what we see in the book of Numbers when God instructed Moses to lift up a bronze serpent that whoever was uh, whoever looked or be, beheld or whoever looked upon the bronze serpent, it doesn't matter what was biting them, the snakes that were biting them all around, when they looked at that serpent, they were healed. And now he says that Christ has also been lifted in the same way. When this was being written in John chapter 3, Christ had not died. So it was speaking about something that would happen when Christ died, that he will also be lifted up. Praise God. Then verse 15 says, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. Whoever believes in Christ should not perish but have what? Eternal life. And that is what we are talking about today. Then verse 16, a verse that is well known in all the world. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. So he's talking about two things here. He's talking about perishability and uh, eternal life. Then verse 17 says, For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that through the world, uh, but that through him, okay, okay, but that the world through him might be saved. Praise God. Uh, I want to emphasize on verse 15 and verse 16. He says, That whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. Then 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. So I want to talk about eternal life and uh, I want to start by defining what eternal life really means because there are so many uh, places where you've had eternal life or you've had everlasting life being uh, explained and being defined. But I want us to, uh, I want us to have a, a, a very special definitional illustration 
or explanation of what eternal life is all about. The verses that we've read, where the Bible talks about eternal life, the original manuscript, you know, the Bible was originally written in Hebrew and in Greek. The Old Testament was written in Hebrews. Then the New Testament was written in Greek. And then it was translated into all these other translations that we know. But the original uh, the original uh, rendering of the New Testament was in Greek. And the word used for eternal life there is the word zoe, which means, uh, the, the word zoe, that is Z-O-E. That is the life of God. That is life as God has it. Praise be to God. So, but now I would like you to understand something about languages. You realize that in a, in a, in a certain language, you can be having one word, but when it is translated into another language, it becomes a, a, a sentence or it becomes, uh, it becomes two words or even three words. Now, like we, now we have the, the Greek word for eternal life is zoe. But now when they were in, uh, translating it to English, it became two words, eternal life. Others call it everlasting life, eternal life. So originally it is one word. But when it is being translated into a, an, to the English language, because Greek is a higher language than, uh, than English, praise God. So in the lower language, when it is being translated, it comes out as two words, eternal life. Then we have another, another lower language, like we have Swahili. So in Swahili, it comes out as uzima wa milele. So English is higher than Swahili. Swahili is higher than, like now we have kikuyu. The kikuyus will say, muoyo wa tene na tene. It becomes five words. But you see, originally it was one word. But as you continue translating it into different lower languages, it becomes a sentence, it becomes two words, and, and it continues like that. So I want us to know, the original meaning of the word zoe as it is written so you can read like this for god so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have zoe have zoe so what is zoe so when it is translated in english what comes into our mind it's a long life or it's living forever and i want to make a statement that maybe will leave you either confused, but I pray that you not be confused in Jesus' name. Yes, you not be confused. Eternal life does not mean living forever. Eternal life does not mean living forever. Mm -hmm. Follow me closely. Every human being, everyone that is in this world, will live forever, whether they are born again or whether they are not born again. Everyone in the world will live forever. Mm -hmm. Are we together up to that point? Yes, I know we are together. So eternal life does not mean living forever. So what does it mean? We've seen that everyone in the world will live forever, whether they are born again or not born again. But there are people who will live forever eternally separated from God. Mm -hmm. There are others who will live forever in union with God. There is something we call eternal death, eternal death. And maybe I should also define the word death. Many people think like uh, that, that death means to, see, uh, to cease to exist or ceasing to exist. But death does not mean you are ceasing to exist. Death means separation. There are two, kinds, two major kinds of death. There is the physical death and then there is the spiritual death. The physical death does not mean that someone ceases to exist. No. It means the separation of the soul from the body. So what we are left here on this side of earth is the body. And because we have no use for the body, we bury it. Yeah. Second Corinthians chapter 5. Second Corinthians chapter 5. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Second Corinthians chapter 5. And again, I will read from the, I will be reading from the, the, the new King James Version. So I want to show you something about the body. The body is not the real you. The body is your temple or it's your tent. It's a tent. Second Corinthians chapter 5 from verse 1. He says, I'm reading from the New King James. For we know if our earthly house, 
this tent is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For we know that if our earthly house... So, what is Paul talking about when he says our earthly house? He's talking about the body. This is the body that houses me. The, past, the body that you are seeing right now as you are watching this episode is not me. This is the body that houses me. Praise God. And this is the body that helps me to communicate with you. On this earth, no one can operate without this body. Praise God. That is why even when God wanted to come into this world, he had to put on a body. A body, the Bible says that a body was prepared for him. Because if he came in form of a spirit and started walking here in form of a spirit, he would be illegally here and he would be going against his own laws. And because God is just and God cannot uh, go against his own laws when he wanted to come into this world he had to put on a body praise God but that is not him the body of Jesus that was here was not Jesus it was the, the house that housed Jesus Christ hallelujah he says for we know that if our earthly house this tent is destroyed so that is to say a time will come when this house will be destroyed because it's not my eternal dwelling place. I will not live in this body forever. So there will come a time when this body will be, will be destroyed. Praise God. But even when it is destroyed, even when this body uh, cannot, uh, when, when this body ceases to, to have life, the, 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 the normal human life, I will still live. Why? Because I am not this body. This is my house. And this house helps me to live in this world. The world that we are in is a physical world. We see things with our physical eyes. We relate with each other in a physical world. Praise God. That is why you eat physical food. Why? Because you have the physical body. But do not be lied to or do not be deceived to think like you are this body. You are not this body. This is your house. Let me read the, the, that, sum, that same verse. That same verse, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 1, using the Passion Translation, says, We are convinced that even these bodies we live in, so how do, what does it say about the bodies? That these bodies we live in. So, uh, it is good to know that man is a spirit, he has a soul, and he lives in the body. So I was explaining the physical death. The physical death is the separation of the soul and the spirit from the body. So when a man dies, he does not stop to exist. He does not cease to exist. But now he starts existing in a different realm. But what he does is to be separated from the body. And now that we don't have any use for the body, that is why we bury the bodies. But there are, some, uh, there are some institutions that use those bodies, maybe for experiments and for other activities. Well and good. That is why there are people who, uh, who ask questions like, should a believer, should, be, uh, should Christians be burnt? Should they the, should, uh, can, uh, is it good for them to be burnt? You know? uh, whatever they decide to do with the body after I've left, it's their choice. Because I will not need that body anyway. <laughs> Praise God. Hallelujah. I know we are still together. So he says, we are convinced that even if these bodies we live in are folded up to at death like tents, we still have a God-built home that no human hands have built. Praise God, which will last forever in the heavenly realm. Hallelujah. So even if we are separate, even if this body is folded away, because this body cannot live forever. It will, it will die at a point. It will, be, uh, it will be old to live in this world. So at that point, when I leave the body, okay, wh when I leave the body, uh, whatever they decide to do with my body, it's up to them. Whether they decide to, to burn it or to, to, to bury it, it's up to them. I don't care. But the real me will still continue living. Hallelujah. So I was explaining the, the meaning of physical death physical death. Then there is the other death which is called the spiritual death. Now spiritual death again does not mean you are not existing spiritually. It means you are existing but you are separated from God. 
Praise God. And now, this takes us back to the book of Genesis chapter 1. In Genesis chapter 1, the Bible tells us that uh, God created man and he placed him in the garden of Aden. And he told them that of all the trees in the garden you may eat except the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Because when you eat of that tree, you will surely die. Praise God. And the question comes in. So when they ate, did they die? Mm. Now this is where we see the, 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 the beginning of the, the, the physical and the spiritual death. Now, physically, they did not die immediately. Actually, Adam lived so many other years uh, after that. But did they die? God had said that they would die. Did they die? Yes, they died. How did they die? Look at this. When God came into the garden in the cool of the day, like it was his norm in the cool of the day, the Bible says that he used to come and fellowship with them. But on this material uh, day, when he came, because they had died, remember we say it, spiritual death means being separated from God. So when he came into the garden of Aden, because they had died and they had been separated from God, God came into the garden and he asked them, Adam, where are you? Does it mean that he was not seeing them physically? No. Physically he could see them, but spiritually he could not see them. And actually he was not seeing them actually. Why? Because God is spirit and he was not seeing them for they, have, they had fallen short of his spiritual reality. They had been separated from God. Hallelujah. Now that is what we call spiritual death being separated from God. That is what happened. Now, uh, the, 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 the most serious death is not the physical death. No, not the physical death. God does not even recognize the physical death because he is a spiritual God. Look at this. When, when, uh, when this guy, his name is Lazarus, when he died, Jesus wanted to go and raise the, the guy. And this is what Jesus told the disciples. Guys, you know what? I want us to go and wake one of us who is asleep. Come on, you're saying waking, waking him up. So they wondered how, so if he is asleep, whoever is asleep will wake up at their own will. So they were, they were wondering, what are you saying by telling us to go and wake him up? So he had to come down to their level and tell them, okay, he is dead. But you see, in his reality, he was not dead. Praise God, he was just asleep. Hallelujah. So the most serious death, is, the, is not the physical death, but the spiritual death. So you should not be worried about the, your, your relatives or your people who died. Why? Who died physically? Why? Because as long as they had Christ in them, they are still in union with God. Praise God. It is, and now the next question is, is it possible to be dead spiritually and you are alive physically? Yes, it is possible. Everyone who has, not, who has not received Christ is alive physically, but separated with God spiritually. So he is dead spiritually. Praise God. So what happens at salvation? Remember, we are still talking about eternal life. Don't forget that. So what happens at salvation? What happens at salvation is that you receive the life of God. But maybe before you get there, I want to tell you, uh, to show you something. When Jesus was at the cross, you know, Jesus was both God and man. He was both physical and spiritual. And the Bible tells us that when he was at the cross, he cried with a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, or my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Do you know what that meant? That meant that at that moment, Christ was separated from God. And what do we call that? Spiritual death being separated from God. So that is why in the garden of, uh, of Gethsemane, when Jesus was praying about his death, he was asking God, it was the, 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 the most painful moment, the most painful hour for him. Why? Because for the first time in history, he was to experience a separation from God. It had never happened. It was to happen for the very, very first time. And why did this happen? He died spiritually so that you and I can be given the spiritual life. Everything that happened to Christ happened to him so that you and I can receive what he lost. Praise God. So before he died physically, he died spiritually. And at what point did he die spiritually? When he cried, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? The Bible says in the book of Romans chapter 8, 
It says that the spirit of God in us confirms with our spirits that we are sons of God and therefore makes us, through that spirit, he, he, he enables us to call God our Father or Abba Father. So at this moment, because, this, the, uh, because Christ or Jesus had been separated from God, the spirit that confirms with our spirits that we are sons of God, enabling us, us to call God Father had left. So he didn't say my father, my father. Why? He was separated from God for a while so that you and I can be united or can be in union with God. So he said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And you realize all through his life when Jesus was here on earth, he never called God God. He always called him Father. But at this specific moment, he called him my God, my God. Why? Because, uh, because he had been separated with him. Praise God. Hallelujah. This is awesome. And now, that is what we mean when we say that he died both spiritually and physically. But the spiritual death came before the physical death. Praise God. So before he died physically, he had died spiritually. Hallelujah. Wow, that is awesome. So he was separated from God. Now, uh, he did that with a purpose or for a purpose. And the purpose was... He was separated from God that we may be brought into union with God. And I want us to go to the book of Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 2. Oh, hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Ephesians chapter 2. Uh, we take it up using the New King James Version. He says, And you he made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins in which you once walked according to the course of this world. Okay, let's just take verse 1. He says, and you, he made alive. So why, was, uh, why were we being made alive? Because we were dead. When, when Adam sinned, he died. He, he was separated from God. He died spiritually, separated from God. And everyone that is born after his likeness, is born separated from God, whether you like it or not. Whether you are born, you are born in a uh, in the church, or whether your mother is your the archbishop, whether your father is the extreme right reverend honorable doctor bishop, whether you it doesn't matter where, where you come from, you are born dead. Why? You are born separated from God. Why? Because of Adam's sin. The Bible says, "For by one man sin entered into the world, and death." because of sin. So we were born dead and separated from God. But now in, when we receive Christ, now Ephesians chapter 2 verse 1 says, you he made alive. We have been made alive who are dead in trespasses. Those people who are dead, you and I were dead in trespasses because of Adam. But now we have been made alive. Praise God. And that is the greatest revival that can ever happen to a man. You no, know, I hear people talking about a spiritual revival, in need spiritual revival, in need spiritual revival. No, there is no son of God. There is no one who is born of God who needs spiritual revival. Why? It happened once and for all. It can never happen again because revival means taking something that was dead and bringing it back to life. You cannot be, uh, you cannot be brought back to life because you already have been brought into life through Christ Jesus. You are dead in sins and trespasses and now you have been made alive. Praise God. You have been made alive. And verse, uh, verse 4 says, But God who is rich in mercy, because, we, because of his great love, we are in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 4, because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead, we were dead in trespasses, he made us alive. Mm, he made us alive. So you have been made alive. You are alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. And raised us up together and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So the, the, the raising that we received is together with Christ. We were raised, we were made alive together with Christ. So that is to mean that we were made partakers of what he had. Because we were raised with him. So we were made partakers of the life of God. 
Hallelujah. The life of God. And now, John 3, 16, where we read, says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Why, was his, uh, why did he give his only begotten son? To die, so that when he dies, those who will believe in him will not perish, but will have eternal life, will have the life of God. So now, in Ephesians 2, 6, says, and he raised us together with Christ. So that is to say that when Christ was raised, we were raised with him. And now the verse, uh, verse 16 of John chapter 3 was fulfilled because now when we were raised, we were raised with him and we were raised with eternal life. So now when we believe, we, we are brought into this oneness with God. So I said eternal life does not mean to live forever. It means to be in union with God because Everyone that is in the world will either uh, live eternally dead, I was defining eternal death, or will live eternally alive, that is uh, eternally in union with God. So that is where we see eternal death. So eternal death is for everyone who does not accept this gift of salvation. And how do you receive this gift of salvation? Again, John 3, 16, that whoever believes in him shall not Ha, shall not perish but have eternal life praise god shall not be separated from god but will forever be in union with god so eternal death or et living forever but separated from god is for those who don't have christ in them hallelujah but they will still live forever in hell that is why we talk about hell though i don't like talking about hell because i'm not a preacher of hell i'm a preacher of the gospel praise god then those who are in christ now they will live forever but they will live forever with the life of God, with the DNA of God, with the union of God. Hallelujah. Praise God. I don't know what you think about that, but that is the gospel of Christ. So eternal life, must it must be established in your heart that eternal life is not just living forever, though it is good that you live forever. It is living forever in union with God. I want us to go to the book of John chapter 17. John chapter 17, uh, verse 3. And again, we'll take it up using the New King James Version. John chapter 17, verse 3. This is where we have uh, the Lord's Prayer. The Lord's Prayer. Okay. I know most people call what they call the Lord's Prayer is the one in Matthew chapter 6, verse 9, where he says, Our Father who art in heaven. That's not the Lord's Prayer. That is the prayer that he taught the disciples to pray. But now the Lord's Prayer is in John 17, verse 3. Uh, in John chapter 17, he says, and this is, okay, I can start from verse 1. Jesus spoke these words, lifted up his eyes to heaven, and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your son, that your son also may glorify you, as you have given him authority over all the flesh, that he should give eternal life. So who gives eternal life? It's Christ, praise God. And notice, he gives, he gives eternal life to as many as you have given him. Then verse 3 says, and this is eternal life, that you may know, that they may know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. So what is eternal life? That they may know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. Hallelujah. I want to stop it at that point for today. Then in our next episode, I will expound more on this verse 3. And this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. So eternal life is a knowledge. Eternal life is a knowledge. So do not move away. Keep tuned to Emma TV. And this is Beholding Christ Show because this is amazing. You know, when you understand what eternal life means and when you understand that eternal life is not a promise for the future, it is a present day reality to those who are in Christ Jesus, then your life can never, never ever be the same again. So join me in our next episode and I know your life will be transformed completely in Jesus' name. Let me pray for you. Father, I thank you for my viewers today. Thank you they are blessed in Christ Jesus. I speak the life of God concerning them. Everything that is of God is what is allowed in their lives. Anything that is not of God is rooted out because it does not belong to them. It does not belong to where they are. Thank you that your word is working in their lives 
and you have given them the ability of both to will and to do according to your good will. We thank you, Lord, and we worship you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen and amen. So my name is Ben Fetcher. Thank you for tuning in. This has been Beholding Christ Show, and this is Wema TV. You are blessed in Christ Jesus, and no man, nothing, nobody can do anything about it. Hallelujah. Amen.